Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think that we are gonna give everyone, uh, you know, about five minutes to start to trickle in before we actually start our, uh, our class and do our introductions. But in the meantime, if anybody wants to jump off a of mute and say hello, feel free. We would love to see your faces. <laughs> Yes, we love when we're teaching these classes when we can see faces. That's no pressure. We understand. Keep your camera off if you want to keep your camera off. But you are welcome to turn your camera on because we love uh, seeing people while we're teaching. Yes. So there's like two things happening. I feel like I know a lot of people have Zoom fatigue, which I have. And I know you have too, Latiana. But we also have fatigue of not seeing other people's faces without a mask or anything like that. Yes. So I would love to see some smiling faces this morning. It's a beautiful day. Pamela, that is so true. <laughs> no, really, we don't even see faces. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> you know, I think I, oh, so I went to my, um, a family member's house like a few weeks ago and I go in, the, they open the door, I go in the door and everybody looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, hi. And like, once I took, I guess, like the hood off of the mask, they said, girl, I didn't know who that was under that hood and that mask. <laughs> I know it's crazy. And you know what I think about too, uh, you know, even for like Zane or like, you know, like infants, like, yes. you know, kids that are really young, I'm like, I wonder if it affects their development. Cause they're like, you know, understanding what faces are and responding to facial expressions. I'm just like, yeah, they need to see people without masks on. <laughs> yeah. When I go to pick him up sometimes from school, it takes him a while to realize that it's me. I come in and I say hello to him and I'm like, Zane, I'm your mother. Like, <laughs> it's like, oh, hey, mom. <laughs> right. Okay, people are continue, continuing to trickle in. Um, we're going to give about two more minutes to allow people um, time to log in. Um, and if you haven't noticed in the chat, we just wanted to give everyone a heads up that we are recording this session. If you would prefer not to be recorded, you... Um, you can log off and we can send you a link to the recording um, or you can keep your video off. But we just want to make sure that everyone knows that we are recording this. And uh, hello to Christine and hello to Nia. Love to see your faces. Hey, ladies. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Looks like we got about two more minutes. Gonna let a few more people in. And I imagine that people are gonna continue to just uh, to pop in mm -hmm. after we start. Right, that always happens. Yeah. I feel like we need to have some music playing in the background. I know, something soft. Mm-hmm. I just uh, just felt like a little Erica Erica vibe real quick. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Babu. You know what's really weird that you mentioned that? I literally had a dream about Lauren Hill last night. Really? It was yeah, it was so weird. It was like I was in the audience, like watching her, like like uh, sing songs from like some new album, and then I was like, let me go on Google and find out what's going on with Lauren Hill. She put out any new music? <laughs> Because this just came to me. Actually, I feel like I saw a headline this week that says something about her going diamond. I don't know if it's a new headline, like her being diamond, maybe like the only woman or the only black woman going diamond. I don't know. But all I know is I saw a headline about her success with the one album. <laughs> Still. Person. What makes sense? All right. It looks like we're at 11.05. So uh, we are going to begin. And yeah, we got a bunch of people in here, so perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am very, very excited about our class. Uh, Latiana and I are just gonna do some brief introductions for those of you who may not be familiar with us or familiar with uh, Black Girls and Green Thumbs and what we do. But my name is Pamia, I'm one of the co-founders. And uh, today we're gonna be doing a class on houseplants for beginners. Yes, um, we are so excited to be here. As I'm sure you all know, you were here with Black Girls with Green Thumbs, and my name is Latiana, and Pamia and I are the co-founders of this organization, and we are a 
community organization that is focused on encouraging people to garden in their homes and within their communities to heal, nourish, and learn. And what that looks like on the program side is each month we, since COVID, because we used to do way more, uh, way more programming in person, of course, but uh, (laughs) since last March, we've pivoted and we've been able to really expand our reach and uh, host monthly online classes. And those classes have been plant-based cooking workshops. They are now how plant classes um, and they've been home gardening classes. So welcome and thank you for joining us this month. We see some new faces so we're really excited for you all to be here and to uh, to join the community. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so a little bit about this class and why I'm personally so excited. Um, so this is actually like our first class that we've done um, that is plant-based and not have anything to do with, you know, edible. <laughs> anything edible uh, as far as plants go. Um, The only plant that we're going to be talking about today that does have some medicinal benefit is aloe, but everything else is kind of like the plants that you see behind me. These are plants that are just for your personal enjoyment and to help, uh, you know, purify the air in your home and just help to beautify your space. Um, I really wanted to focus on this class because it's winter time, right? And I know for me personally, like so many of us are experiencing like, you know, that, uh, what do they call it? Sad seasonal affective disorder and all of these other things. It's like, you know, like the low light of winter can kind of make you depressed. So when I come home after, you know, like shoveling snow or like doing rounds or, you know, like going to the supermarket, it feels really great to come into a space that's green and beautiful when you may not necessarily have that outside during the winter time. And one of the other reasons that we chose to do a house plant, a beginner's house plant class is we recognize what I'll call like the frenzy of house of house plants in the last year. So many people have become new plant mamas and papas. And as I've been like on the different groups on Facebook and obviously like browsing Instagram, I'm seeing so many people fill their homes with, you know, with fresh foliage <laughs> and people have so many questions and um, we figured that we should be a resource to you all because we have some knowledge. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off the class and I do just want to say that Although I've been growing plants uh, for a long time, uh, you know, since I was a child learning from my mother, I still consider myself to be a novice kind of. Um, And that's because I enjoy the species of plants like that my mom started out with so much that I haven't ventured off into like exotics. (laughs) Like, you know, a lot of people have like, you know, like expanded their horizons. I just like really enjoy um, the species that we're going to be talking about with you guys today. So a little bit about my background, I consider myself to be like a second generation uh, houseplant mom. And basically what that means for me is many of the plants that I care for are um, great grandchildren or great or or grandchildren of plants that my mother, uh, you know, either grew from seed or propagated from someone else's plants. Um, So I'll just give you a quick visual of what I'm talking about. So back here, you guys can kind of see this really large plant in the back. That's a Chinese evergreen. And this plant is over, it's about 17 years old. So it doesn't mean that the leaves that you see right here are 17 years old, but this plant has been growing from that same stalk for 17 years. And the same thing for this one, I'm just gonna adjust my camera a little bit. Back here, we're also gonna be talking about uh, the dragon tree plant today. And this is another one that I actually kind of forgot about. I don't tend to this plant as much as I should, but this one is about 20 years old. And uh, if anyone knows me, my mom passed away 10 years ago, God rest her soul. And she at least had this plant for 10 years before she passed. So they're very, very important and uh, special to me. So when I was younger, uh, I kind of watched my mother, you know, care for her plants. And it honestly filled me with a lot of wonder and, uh, and excitement because I started to understand that like human beings had the ability to cultivate plants and like, you know, like bend them and adjust them to our will. And that kind of amazed me. So I've always loved plants uh, since I was a young child. And, uh, you know, I actually didn't get into gardening, garden, garden, <laughs> gardening much later uh, with Latiana until, you know, like after college. So houseplants is kind of like my beginning and uh, very important to me. 
So Camille, I want to show um, people some more photos of the plants that you're that you are taking care of that were your mom's. Sure thing. So Latiana is bringing up some photos that I've sent to her. And this first photo is of a propagation of Chinese evergreen. And uh, if you can kind of see, it's in a picture with some water. And um, the reason for this is because uh, my dog decided he wanted to chew a piece of this plant off. And so I came downstairs one day and this piece of the plant was on the floor. So uh, with the Chinese evergreen plant, one of the beautiful things about, you know, having a stalk fall off or, you know, accidentally being cut or something like that is that it can be propagated if you place it in water. Uh, you want to do that at least within like five days of it being detached from the stalk. Uh, this next photo that you all see is a spider plant. And you can see little offshoots from this plant. We're gonna be talking about this more uh, later during our uh, propagation demonstration. This is also another photo of a fully grown Chinese evergreen plant that is in my bedroom. This is also one of my favorites. This is my baby, also about 18 years old. That's so amazing that um, plants can, we can really think about plants as being part of our legacy that we leave behind as, as things that you can pass on from generation to generation. So while I don't have any plants that are um, multi-generational, I feel really good that I have at least two plants that I have cared for for over eight years or like six to eight years. So I'm really excited about how long that I'm going to be able to keep them alive. One of them is a peace lily that I had received when my grandmother died about five years ago. And in my, at my mom's job, there's a huge peace lily that literally is almost as tall as me. And I said, yo, if I can grow mine that big, <laughs> <laughs> right. I would be amazed at myself. Um, and then I received another plant from my mom when I first started, like one of my early jobs out of college, maybe about 10 years ago. And my little plant is going strong. Unfortunately, I don't have those uh, to share with you all. I'm also in, I'm in the process of moving. So I have one plant today. <laughs> all my other plants are at my, at my home. But um, as you see, I do have this one plant. And what's become a thing with my mom and I is during... Um, I would say like major life transitions, I am being gifted with the plant. So uh, beautifying my home and I, my office space has become sort of a, um, a tradition for me. And I know that many people are beginning to adopt these sort of trans, uh, these traditions. So that might be one of the things that you might receive for housewarming gifts. So, or like I said, like funeral gifts or just, they're so, they're so meaningful. Um, because plants really contribute to your, your personal well-being. So studies have shown that people who surround themselves with greenery, and we could just look at Pamia's, uh, at Pamia's video, her picture, like she's surrounding herself with green, greenery. And people who surround themselves with plants tend to live healthier, more um, happier lives than those who are foliage free. And we're not just saying that. There is a 2017 research study that came out of Harvard that went into detail um, about the benefits of, ha of having house plants. And these could be house plants like the tropical ones that can be mentioned, or it could be the more native plants that you might ha have in your home. Having some greenery really being connected and reconnected to nature uh, contributes to your overall, overall health. So that could look like lower levels of depression, longer life expectancy. Um, they also, having houseplants, honestly, it encourage you to, encourages you to lead more healthier lives. So those are some of the outcomes that uh, were shared in the 2017 Harvard study. But there's some other be benefits that we wanted to share with you as well. So benefits of caring for houseplants include improving your mood. It helps you to reduce, reduce fatigue. It can lower your stress and anxiety, improve performance and focus, helps to boost your health and pain tolerance. Because of the, specifically the plants that we're gonna talk about today, um, these are 
These are plants that help to uh, increase the air quality in your home that can help minimize headaches. So if you're someone who gets migraines or grains or gets headaches frequently, having air purifying plants in your home really helps to minimize that. And it helps to ease the dry skin and respiratory ailments due to dry air because of the uh, because of both the air purification and honestly some plants need more humidity than others so even the process of caring for your plants and maybe the introduction of a humidifier both benefits you the person and the plants that you're caring for yes um i i do want to just uh chime in on what you just said latiana i remember when i was younger i used to get terrible nosebleeds in the winter time like horrendous nosebleeds i would wake up and it'd be blood all over my bed and uh so my dad was like oh just get a humidifier and that like kind of worked but what we realized when, once we introduced the humidifier that like the plants were thriving in the winter time also when we did that so that's definitely on point um and very true uh, so now we're going to get into uh, the type of house plants that may be great for beginners and like Latiana said, very good at purifying the air in our homes. Um, so plants, just like people have a wide, uh, you know, variety of like needs and a huge range of differences. Um, and there's no question that there's some plants that are much easier to take care of than others. And that's why Latiana kind of compiled uh, this list for you guys today. So if you want to start to think about like filling your house with house plants, or maybe not, ne not necessarily filling it, but you know, just starting out with a few plants and seeing how it goes, you want to ask yourself a few questions like right off the bat, right? So you have to think about where you live and uh, how much light you get in different rooms in your house, or if you live in an apartment, uh, you know, is this uh, south facing, is this east facing, west or north? Um, all of those things are going to, you know, definitely go into what type of house plant plants um, are going to thrive in your home. So some of the house plants uh, that I have and that have worked very well for me with very low ease of care have been aloe vera. And Latiana is going to show uh, us a picture of what an aloe vera plant looks like. Uh, with a little bit of information about it. So um, I mentioned in the beginning of this class that aloe vera was the only plant that we were going to talk about today that also has medicinal benefit from the sap that's inside of it. And most people know about that. So, you know, if you break off a little piece of this plant, you know, if you have an open sore or a burn, it's very good at soothing um, a cut or a burn with its anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, they're very tolerant. You have to water them very, very little, and they don't need a whole lot of light. Very, very easy to care for, and also very easy um, to purchase. You can get these at any Home Depot or Lowe's or you know any plant care center. Very, very popular plants. Uh, the next one that we're going to talk about is Dracenia, but it is commonly known as the dragon tree plant. Um, and I did show you guys my mother's dragon tree plant a few seconds ago. Uh, what's beautiful about this plant is that uh, if you do have a place in your house that gets a lot of light, uh, it prefers that. So a lot, it likes a lot of light, but can tolerate low light. So it's one of those plants that, you know, you may be able to place um, in different places in your home. And it removes very specific pollutants. Um, I'm not going to go into even trying to pronounce these, <laughs> but these are common uh, household pollutants that, uh, you know, some of us come across in our homes. Uh, the next plant that we have is the snake plant. So if you look at the visual, um, many of you may be very familiar with this plant, even if you didn't know what it was called. It's very common in households all across the country. And like it says, it's a very, very hard to kill. I've killed a lot of plants in my lifetime, if I'm being completely honest. I have never killed a snake plant. They're very, very easy to take care of them. And I really love snake plants as a pet owner because my cats have never been interested in it and neither have any of them my dogs. So like they might sniff it and they just walk away. Whereas some of the other plants we're gonna talk about today are pretty tempting and tasty uh, to animals if you are a pet parent as well as a plant parent. Uh, the next plant we're talking about today is the spider plant. So if I'm being completely honest, this is my personal favorite. Um, it is the easiest plant that I have ever cared for, like even more so than the snake plant. Um, I personally love it so much more because it self-propagates, 
We're gonna be talking about that more during our uh, propagation demonstration, but uh, it prefers bright light and it does very well. It's gonna have a lot of babies when it hits maturity under bright light, but it can survive in indirect or low light as well. And again, it grows very, very quickly. Um, the one that I have behind me, uh, I believe this one is no less than maybe like two years old and it's humongous. As long as you take care of it, it's gonna take care of you. When I was in middle school, we actually did a spider plant uh, like project and everybody had gotten like little pieces of the plant and we were able to uh, propagate it. It was so fun, it was so interesting to us then. Like, well, you know, back then teachers had a lot more um, ability to be creative. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So um, next up, I did want to mention um, as far as ease of care for plants are succulents and cactus-like plants. And I'll just show you um, a visual of some of the succulents that I have growing in my home. Um, these are very, very easy to care for. It's kind of like in that aloe plant family. They do not need a lot of attention. They survive very well on their own. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, these plants are like native to a lot of desert regions in the country, so they don't need a lot of water at all. Um, you can actually kill these very easily if you overwater them. When I tend to water these, I don't directly water them. I kind of mist them with a sprayer, um, and that's maybe like once every two weeks. Um, and then that will change, uh, you know, depending on the season and the humidity in your home. The thing about like aloe and cactus and succulents, they need very little water because uh, because the water is stored in the leaves. That's what gives them their, their plump look and their plump feel. Yes, um, and I'll just do a quick call back. I don't know if uh, anybody that's participating used to watch the Magic School Bus <laughs> when you were a kid, but they did a whole episode on like desert life and they specifically talked about that. Um, I always thought it was very interesting that some animals in the desert, um, they depend on succulents and you know cacti uh, for their water supply. So they'll tap into that plant and drink the water that's inside. Next up, we have Chinese evergreen. So I did show you guys, um, you know, that large Chinese evergreen that I have in the back here. I also have a bunch of Chinese evergreen um, that I have propagated in water uh, throughout my house. It is very easy. It's also low maintenance um, and very easy to find. It comes in a couple different like color varieties. This one that I have here, I really love it. I'm hoping you guys can see this leaf here. It kind of has like these spots on it that kind of looks like if someone had like green paint on their hands and just kind of flicked it, they have like this really pretty, uh, you know, pattern to them. That's definitely one of my favorite, uh, easy to care for house plants. We have a question um, about caring for aloe and cactus. So if you have a humidifier in the room or a diffuser, can you avoid watering those plants? So I think that would definitely depend on the level of humidity in your room and like where you are in the country. So right now, uh, Latiana and I, we're on the East Coast, uh, we're in Philadelphia. So right now I have a humidifier going pretty much all day in my room, um, not just for my plants, but for my skin health as well. And um, I really haven't had to water them that much, but I also have a humidity detector in my room that lets me know exactly, you know, the percentage of humidity that's going on. So um, I think it would definitely depend on where you are in the country and what the humidity is like in your house. Um, but you can always check the health of your plant by visually inspecting it and also um, checking the soil with the succulents and the cacti sometimes what i do is uh you know like i'll test the soil that's deep below the surface just by putting my hand down there and seeing how dry or wet it is yeah i have a succulent that i keep in my bathroom and we know that's humidity central in the bathrooms and i probably water that maybe once a month see i've tried succulents in my bathroom before they died every time I don't know what it is, but you know. Plants again. are fickle. So Pamia did say like she's killed many of plants and so have I. And I think that is really important to share with you all that as you are entering your plant mama, plant daddy journey, like be really gentle and easy on yourself because 
you're going to kill something and it's okay. Like this, this is an experiment. Just like we say that a lot when we're talking about um, our outdoor edible gardens that you should enjoy the process and you are going to kill something. But as you, as things are dying and things are dying off and you're trying to hold on like that, that is the, that is the space where you are learning the most. Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I wonder if um, I don't want us to miss this, but there was someone in the chat, uh, Julie, who said that she also inherited several plants from her mom's collection. Um, and it has been, it's been so spe special for her to be able to take care of them over the years. It is. It is. You, you really, like, if I ever kill any of my mom's plants, which I have, you know, it's very heartbreaking. But I do want to point out that sometimes when plants die, it's not always necessarily our fault, you know? They're just like any other, you know, being on the planet. All life cycles eventually come to an end. So sometimes it's not your fault. So don't take it, uh, you know, too personally when, you, when your plants do make that transition. And um, at this time, it could be very tempting to uh, to go buy a lot of new plants at once. And uh, we caution you from doing that for several reasons. One, it could be very expensive. And so as you're entering the journey, you want to give yourself the time to, to learn how to care for these plants because of the expense that can build up. Um, so it can feel affordable, like you run in Home Depot, like, oh, that's $7, but here you are, like 10 plants later, you spent like almost $100 on plants, and they might all be different plants, and different plants have different needs. So um, the likelihood that you will be successful with trying to care and manage for all of these huge variety of plants at once is, uh, can be slim. Right, <laughs> unless you just have all day and nothing else to do whatsoever. You know, but that's yeah. up to you guys. <laughs> so there are some plants that require like very low maintenance. Um, and actually some of these are those that require low maintenance outdoors as well as indoors, but they could be, that's mint, ivy. Um, we talked about succulents and cacti, uh, spider plants and aloe. And many people have killed aloe as well. <laughs> yeah, me included. Yes, yes we're people. <laughs> Just like, oh. I'll just water my aloe plant today. Like, <laughs> um, but that was before, you know, we knew what we were doing. I just wanted to show you guys uh, one of my ivy plants. I actually acquired this pretty recently. I want to say maybe about three or four weeks ago. Um, I don't know if Adara is in this class. Um, one of my closest friends, we went out to Lowe's together um, to grab some plants and um, I wanted to grab some English ivy. This is also a very low uh, maintenance plant. It's beautiful. And what my goal is for this ivy, I really wanna have an ivy wall in my bedroom. So I'm gonna try and you know, I'm gonna be updating you guys on Instagram and Facebook with uh, you know, how my experiment goes. But as this plant grows and the vines grow, I plan on having like those vines like cascading down my bedroom wall. I have grand plants. So. <laughs> that is our ivy plant. And I'm creating plans for you. I'm like, we can build a trellis and they can, oh, they can trellis up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, I have this vision in my mind of just like a, a Jumanji type bedroom. And that's, that's my goal. Uh, so after Ivy, uh, we wanted to mention also Peace Lily. Uh, Latiana and I, I don't think La does. Do you have Peace Lily? La? Yes, I have a Peace Lily. Okay, so Latiana does have a peace lily, and I've had peace lilies in the past. And I would say they're they're easy to care for, to moderate. Um, sometimes they can be a little temperamental and fickle. Like like one day you'll just see them, and they're just like all drooped over, and it's just like okay, you're being dramatic. Like and that's why I love them though. Like to me, that, for me that's easy to care for because you're telling me that you need something. It is very dramatic. Like I have photos of the peace lily, like literally drooping, looking all sad. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, it's, it's just so funny to me. So <laughs> my peace lily, I actually water that uh, once a week and it seems to, to like that. I would say of all the plants um, that we've mentioned so far, peace lilies are uh, the best communicators. So like they would yes. definitely tell you uh, what they need and what they like or what they don't like. Um, and the last plant that I wanted to talk to you guys about today, as far as ease of care, um, <laughs> is ponytail palm. Don't judge me on my ponytail palm and how it looks currently because I'm having pet issues right now. So ponytail palms usually uh, look a lot more luscious. Uh, I wish I had pictures of this plant before my cat tore it to shreds. My cat eats this plant like there's no tomorrow. 
And literally, you can tell because the whole bulb is out right now. She just pulls it out and I'll find it on the floor in the morning. So I am trying my best right now to, you know, get this plant back into shape and uh, hopefully I can save it. But um, this is just an example of, you know, life happening. Everything's not always going to work in your household. You can try to make it work if you, you know, if you have the ability to do so. But I'm going to try to save this plant. I just have to find a better spot for it that my cat can't get to. And uh, ponytail palms, they can actually be humongous. Like they can reach like the size of like the dragon tree plant. Um, and they're gorgeous when they're, you know, well taken care of and not being eaten by uh, cats or dogs. <laughs> So uh, all of the plants, uh, oh, someone just said, are any toxic for the cat? So that's a very good question. So um, none of the plants that we talked about today um, have been toxic for my cats. And my cats try to eat plants all the time. So if you see my spider plant back here, you see a bunch of chewed up leaves. Now, I don't necessarily think that these plants uh, in excess are good for cats or dogs but they won't, they're not like so highly toxic that if they take a bite here or there, that's gonna damage their health. So I wouldn't say feed this to your cats necessarily or your dogs, but they're not, you know, they're not very, very toxic. Um, I do wanna mention also that the SPCA does have a list on their website of highly toxic plants that you don't wanna have around dogs or cats and then a list of plants that work very well uh, for dogs or cats to have them in the household together. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, like most of the plants that we talked about today are on that go list. So they're, they're green lighted. And we did have an incident recently, um, a pet toxicity uh, incident recently that uh, really influenced for me to, to dig down deep into the toxicity of different plants that she kept in her home. So she has a new puppy and she had a cutting of an elephant ear plant. And I think you've seen, like they have been like all the rage recently. So mm -hmm. these are those huge plants that you might see in front of people's homes with like, sometimes they're like five feet tall. And yeah. but they start obviously like really small. So Pamia had one growing in her room and her dog took a little bite. And when I say little bite, I mean like the tiniest bite ever. Um, for anyone that follows us on Instagram, I actually made a post about it and I showed, uh, you know, he's a puppy. So the bite was very, very small. And uh, it was a very, very scary situation because it immediately, I wanna say 30 seconds after he took a bite from this plant, he was, he was throwing up violently. And uh, after I did some research, you know, I realized that this elephant ear plant, you know, was very highly toxic um, to dogs and cats. So much so that some animals, you know, have passed away from ingesting them. Um, so the elephant ear plant is actually, uh, the sap is formulated with these types of crystals that when they come into contact with saliva or, you know, any other kind of like wet substance, uh, it, it has like an explosive reaction. So like, as soon as my dog like chewed it and it hit that saliva, he was like, oh, what is happening? And you know, he just started like going crazy. Um, like I said, it was a very scary thing. I ended up getting rid of that plant within the next couple of days. And uh, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because I love that plant, but uh, you know, I love my puppy more. So <laughs> I had to get rid of it. And we're gonna move into uh, talking about different resources that you all could use both online and offline to help you identify plants and to help learn more about plants. Um, and plants, house plants in particular, fall into six different varieties. They could be woody plants, aquatic plants, grass-like plants. So Camilla has a lot of grass-like plants. Um, so that would be the spider plant, um, the, what's the tree behind you? Uh, you're talking about the, dra the dragon tree? Yes. The dragon tree, that would actually be oh, considered woody. A, a woody plant. I don't know if you guys can see, but the stems, uh, I mean, yeah, the stems and the stalks are very wood-like and hard. Right. Um, orchids and ferns and then non-woody plants, which is pretty, uh, pr pretty wide, <laughs> wide variety. Like other. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so a peace lily would be a non-woody plant. <laughs> Yes, um, and I did want to share with you guys um, a, a resource that I use. Um, there is an app called Plant Snap, and um, if I'm not mistaken, they have a free version still available. 
um, but they also have a paid version, which I use. Um, and it's awesome for identifying house plants as well as, you know, like uh, native plants you might see on your lawn outside, even to, uh, you know, plants that are used for gardening and farming purposes. Um, and you can just, what was it like, $3? Yeah, I think it was like $2.99 or something. Yeah. And so basically all you do is you take a really nice photo um, of a plant that you're curious about. And what that uh, app will do is it'll, um, you know, it'll compare your photo to thou hundreds of thousands of other photos that other people have submitted um, to help you identify that plant. And, you know, just keep in mind that some uh, plants come in a variety of species. So, you know, you might have to go through a couple, you know, slides before you find the one um, that's right for you. But it's been a great resource for me because I find plants all the time that I want to know what they are and if I should bring them into my home or not. And uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Oh, the other cool thing about it is that um, they also have a community that's similar to Instagram on the app. So you can just like upload pictures of your plants all day and people will like them and comment on them. Uh, but it's only, you know, for plants. It's pretty cool. Yeah, there are actually a lot of online communities uh, that are available for houseplants, essentially. Um, I've been recently utilizing Facebook and Instagram and different chat groups um, to learn more about plants and honestly just to see who our people are like who else likes plants who else like is wants to fill their home home with plants uh so you know sometimes you gotta really dig deep to find your tribe and fortunately you don't have to dig that deep there are like hundreds of house plant groups on facebook yes <laughs> Uh, so real quick, as we're moving through, um, I also wanted to share with you guys a, a book resource. Uh, one of my favorite books is this book called Power Plants, and it's by Frankie Flowers and Bryce Wild. And this plant, uh, this plant, this book goes into detail about all different types of plants, um, house plants, gardening plants, and, you know, just to show you, you know, it has some great pictures and resources. This one right here is of uh, aloe vera. I think the book is about 35 bucks uh, on Amazon, but if you're really interested in learning about, um, you know, the plants and their historical, you know, and cultural, like the way that they, you know, like are referenced in our culture and what they're used for nowadays, it's ex an excellent resource for that. And lastly, um, in addition to, you know, reaching out to people that you know, like doing in per, you know, in person information shares and knowledge shares. Samia has been talking about how a few of her friends are new plant moms and they've been spending so much time essentially like uh, communing and networking and loving on each other with this, with these plants. Uh, so in addition to your the friends and the tribe that you build around plants, there are other uh, other resources that are more formal, like the county extensions in your in your region. So in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area, the, our county extension is ran by Penn State. And Penn State has so many different resources, both for growth around house plants, outdoor edible plants, and other just gardening topics uh, that we have used over the years. So I just want to get it to a time check for me because I want to make sure we have enough time for your propagation. So it is 1140. Okay. Yeah, we definitely have time. Okay. Um, so before we go into houseplant propagation, we're just going to talk a little bit about soil because um, I know uh, I always had a lot of questions about it. Like no one ever told me that there was a specific type of soil you need for houseplants versus like outside plants. So... I'm just going to show you all very quickly. I have this kind of little uh, like soil station. I have this little soil station um, of amended soil that I keep around because I have so many potted plants in my house. So one of the things you guys want to make sure that you do is purchase potting soil versus gardening soil. And the main reason for this is the porosity, right? So gardening soil tends to be like very uh, thick and wet and heavy. And if we use garden soil for potting plants, yeah, potting soil is not gardening soil. Um, if we use gardening soil for potting our indoor plants, they wouldn't do very well because of the porosity. Um, you need something that, you know, the roots are gonna be able to move around in and, uh, you know, the plants are gonna be able to actually uh, soak up the water that we water them with. 
So back to my little like uh, soil station here. As you can see, I have a bunch of eggshells in it. Um, this is mixed in with potting soil as well as some coconut husk. Um, and all of these things make for like really great nutrient dense, uh, rich soil. And, uh, you know, it's very easy and cheap to do on your own. And uh, for a visual or to think about it, um, to compare both, I would, I would say like gardens or outdoor soil. So if you've ever received any plants, any flowers that come with soil and think about like how light that soil is and um, how when you pick it up, it can essentially like just flow through your fingers. Like that's the sort of porosity and the sort of lightness that we're referring to compared to outside. Like when you go outside and you're looking at the plants that are growing around in your neighborhood or in front of your home, like the dirt, the soil that that's in is much more heavy, especially in comparison to those plants that you might get from a florist or the supermarket or any anywhere where plants are sold. Um, and I do want everyone to keep in mind also, because this is something that I've done in the past, just trying to be a cheapskate, is you don't want to go outside and dig up soil for that same reason, because that soil, like Latiana mentioned, is very different. Um, one of the other things behind that is you don't want to bring um, any diseases from outside soil um, or outside plants that could harm your plants inside. I know uh, I had dug up some soil uh, like a couple of summers ago and I, I must have bought in like an egg sack from some kind of like bug or something. And I had bugs everywhere in my house. So, you know, that's, that's something you want to avoid if you can. So and now we are- Another thing to consider when we're thinking about soil um, is repotting. So Camille is gonna get into plant propagation and she'll describe what that actually means. But you may start to think about your soil more when you are repotting your plant. So one, one reason you may re repot your plant is because it's growing, which is a good thing. So you've been successful, your plant is growing. And um, when you're repotting, you, you want to for sure get a pot that allows proper drainage. So a, a pot that has hole, drainage holes in it, or some pots don't have it, so you can create a drainage situation with, uh, with stones or um, broken up clay pots, but the best practice would be to buy, and the easiest thing, so I would say best practice and ease is to buy a pot or a planter that actually has drainage holes or that you can make drainage holes with. So, whatever that planter or pot looks like, you do want it to be clean and um, like wash your dishes clean, clean it out. Because if you're using, if this is a pot that you're reusing um, with an old plant or that may have set outside for a while, as to be mentioned, you don't want to uh, have plant diseases transfer from one plant to the other. And um, essentially you really just want the best growing environment that, that you can, since you have control over the growing environment, especially when you're putting a new plant into a new planter, you want to start off with a clean slate. And another best practice while you're doing this is to wear gloves for the same reason, wear gloves so you're not transferring any diseases or illnesses between plants. Absolutely. Um, so when it comes to uh, houseplant propagation, you kind of want to follow those same rules that Latiana was talking about when it comes to, you know, making sure all your tools are clean and you're not like transferring any uh, bacteria or diseases from plant to plant. But uh, outside of plant bacteria and diseases, you know, human hands can be nasty and dirty too. So that's where washing your hands really well comes into play or wearing gloves. Uh, if you can do that. So plant propagating, uh, I am obsessed with right now. Um, anyone that knows me personally knows that I have propagation stations all throughout my home. Um, this one back here on um, this black um, piece of furniture right here, I don't know if you guys can see it, hopefully you can, is all spider plants um, that have come from this mother plant right over here on this side. So propagating is honestly the most expensive way uh, to create new plant life in your home and to grow your, uh, your plant family. So one of the most important things that you want to do uh, when you choose a plant to propagate is just to make sure you have a pretty healthy plant. And I liken this to anyone that's ever done like any kind of like uh, animal breeding. So if you have a dog or a cat that has like, you know, health issues or behavioral issues, this isn't an animal that you want to, uh, you know, procreate, right? <laughs> it's the same thing with plants. So this is an example um, of a spider plant that is doing very well, is very healthy and it's mature. 
flower. And one of the ways that you know that the spider plant is mature is that it has these little babies that is growing from it. Again, this plant was grown from the plant that you see behind me here. So I just want you to see that it has like these little stems that will grow smaller baby plants on their own. And this is the beauty of spider plants and why um, I want you guys to start out with these if this is a new thing for you, because they propagate themselves so much so that if this was a very large pot and it had these little offshoots in it, these will actually replant themselves right in the soil. So these plants can uh, grow and you know participate in asexual reproduction without human interference at all, which I think is a really cool thing. So I'm just gonna show you guys how to propagate a spider plant. First things first, um, I have plant scissors here that I use. And just to keep everything nice and clean, what I usually do is um, I'll take an alcohol swab, I'll open that up because I use this for all different types of plants. And I'll just clean it real quick just to make sure that it is sterile. And next up, I'm just gonna sit this here and hopefully you guys can still see. Yes. Yes, we have a good visual for me. Okay, awesome. So the next thing I'm gonna do, make sure these are dry, is I'm just gonna cut off right at that stem as close as possible. And it's literally that easy. I'm gonna place this one down and do the same thing for this next little offshoot here. Um, and one thing I want you all to keep in mind is that um, there's gonna be a bunch of little babies that grow on mature plants. But what I like to do is I like to wait until they're a little bit larger. So they can be like this tiny or they can be this size or even bigger than this. But I like to wait until you know they become a little bit more mature before I detach them from the mother plant just because they're a little bit stronger. So once you've done that, all you need honestly is a glass a clean glass with some water. Uh, for this class today, um, I would love to present to you this beautiful propagation station that Latiana gifted to me. Um, I believe this came from like a florist and is usually used for flowers, but I've been using it to propagate spider plants. So all you have to do is literally sit that stem into the water in a glass and I uh, tell people to use glasses because the beauty of using glasses is that you can see the root formations um, versus if it's in like a mug or a cup where you wouldn't be able to see that. Um, and it's very fun to watch. And if you don't like uh, to replant into soil, you actually don't have to. These can survive on their own in water indefinitely. And um, I just wanna show you guys uh, an example of a spider plant propagation that this one is probably, I wanna say about a month old at this point. And you can see how well those roots have formed. And uh, if you're doing this as an experiment, it's kind of cool because you can see it growing and maturing in real time. Uh, something else that you wanna watch out for when you're propagating spider plants, and this is a good example of that, is not having too much of the leaf inside the water because what'll happen then is the leaves will start to rot and it'll make your water you know, not great to propagate in and the plant as a whole will start to die. So you kind of want to make sure that if that happens, you can take your plant out of the water and I'll show you all, as you can see here, some of those leaves that were inside the water started to brown a little bit and I'll just like take them off with my hands so that they don't contaminate the water and then just place it right back in there. The goal with the propagation is essentially to provide some space for the roots to grow. So if you keep that in mind that we are propagating roots, we're not propagating like the leaves of the plant. Yes. Um, and one of the most amazing things about plants to me is that they just have the ability, um, you know, to, to duplicate themselves so, so effortlessly, right? It's amazing. It's like, you know, when you were in school, like in elementary school, we learned about asexual reproduction. And that's essentially like what propagation is. Um, there's so many different uh, ways to, uh, to propagate plants. This water propagation demonstration is my personal favorite because like I said, you can visually see it in time as it's growing and maturing, but there are other ways. 
Uh, so one of the other ways, um, and I'm going to reference this evergreen plant again, because this will be the perfect example of doing a, a cutting propagation. If I wanted to, I could uh, take this plant out of its pot, and you would probably want to do this outside, and grab a very sharp knife and literally divide these stalks up. And if I wanted to, I could give one to Latiana, I could give one to my neighbor. And this is just another way of, you know, for free, <laughs> very inexpensive, you know, duplicating plants that you have so that, you know, you can have additional plants in your home. Um, another way of propagating um, is doing uh, rooting of a leaf. So this works really well with succulents or aloe vera in particular. And uh, the way you would do that is very easy with succulents. Like you see this one that we have here. Like if I was to pop one of the leaves off and I don't like hurting my plants, but they say they can't feel pain. So if I was to pop one of these leaves off and literally just place it in the soil in a few weeks under the right conditions, this leaf would start to grow little stems and just implant itself into the soil also. And this is very low maintenance. Again, why we added succulents and aloe vera to this list, because they have that ability to self-propagate and give you more beautiful plants without spending another dime. I love it. So we talked about uh, dividing, we talked about rooting and uh, rooting for a cutting. I'm also gonna reference uh, Chinese evergreen for this one as well. Um, I think this is a really good example. I got to get up to show you guys this one. But this was a Chinese evergreen plant that once upon a time was doing very well. And then my dog got to it. <laughs> so as you see, I didn't go and, you know, throw this all away or repot it. I'm hoping that you guys will be able to see that uh, on the stalk of a Chinese evergreen plant, even if all of the leaves are gone and all of the stems are gone, this plant will start to grow back on its own. So if you see this stalk here, you can see like little nubs. I'm hoping you guys can see them. There's one right here and there's one right here. And eventually what will happen is a new plant will form from those. And that is also something that you don't have to participate in. As long as you keep it watered, this plant will grow back to you know its former glory if you just give it time. Oh, this is heavy. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a great way for us to uh, wrap up the wrap up the class because you don't have to give up on on your plants, and um, the the more as you go through the journey and the more you learn about taking care of your plants, then you'll start to realize their different personalities and their personalities are related to like how it keeps itself alive. So while, like you said, that plant will grow little nodules and be able to have essentially a second life where some plants are just going to die. And, <laughs> and that's okay. I was talking to Mia about a time um, where I had a plan of mine and it was just, it just was dying. And then I just let it die. I just stopped because I just needed a break. I said, you know what? I need a break from caring from thing, caring for things. And I, and it felt so good to allow something in my life to not be perfect. Um, so in addition, like to me, that's another benefit of having house plans. Like there are some things that you can let go of and you don't have to feel burdened with the care for it or the perfect or burdened with the profession, the perfectionism of uh, caring for things. Yes, I definitely uh, went through that myself. And, you know, during this whole pandemic, uh, it's given me an opportunity to really reconnect, I think, with my house plants because, you know, I'm home a lot more than I've ever been. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just been very interesting. Uh, Latiana kind of coined this phrase uh, when we first started Black Girls with Green Thumbs, um, you know, hashtag lessons from my garden. And uh, I feel like, you know, it can be said for house plants as well. Like we've learned so much, uh, you know, just from watching our plants grow and, you know, seeing their life cycles and, you know, just how that relates to us. Like we're all living things that need to be cared for. Um, but even when we seem like, you know, all is lost or, you know, like the dawn has set on us, you know, we can have a new life. So that's my takeaway. So there's a, so I want to open it up for the last few minutes with some questions. I did get a, we do have two questions in the chat already. Um, one is, do you have any advice to me for growing potted snake plants indoors this time of year? 
Um, and I would think right off the bat, that would be managing the humidity, managing the moisture in the air for, mm -hmm. for your snake plants and other similar tropical plants like that. Yes, um, so I'll show you, I don't, I, my one snake plant that's over here is much too heavy for me to pick up and show you guys, but um, I'll just show you the other one that I showed you in the beginning. Once I noticed that my snake plant was starting to wilt kind of a little bit, like how you see this one is, what I did was I added some small rocks uh, to the top layer of the soil. And what that did was started to, you know, cause it's been so dry in the winter time. I personally run space heaters a lot. And, you know, just like you'll notice like with your skin, your skin is gonna be very dry. Your plants are gonna be reactive uh, to the uh, difference in the temperature and the humidity in the air also. So just by adding those rocks, it allows your soil to, you know, retain a little bit more moisture. Like if you're going to be away from home and you're concerned about your plants not being watered and, a, you know, not a lot, but just like a small layer of rocks on the top has really helped uh, my snake plants in particular. Thank you. There is another <laughs> question. Do you have any tips on uh, carnivorous plants like Venus flytraps? So I don't, um, I've had one Venus flytrap my whole life and I was a child and it died. <laughs> I had no idea what to do with it. Um, I thought that flies were gross. Um, so no, that's not something that I really know much about the carnivorous plants. Do you, Latiana? I don't, I have not, uh, I have not ventured down that, that route. But I will say that I did see in one of the plant groups on Facebook, I did see someone uh, with some tips and who had their own, like actually like many different many different types of carnivorous plants. So I would point you in a direction of uh, utilizing your online community and seeing what, what people are doing to keep their plants alive and keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. So Nia asks, what is the best climate for a peace lily? So I, I, I don't know if I would say like the best climate, but within your home, uh, peace lilies, they like they like direct light, but they can handle like some some low, some indirect light. Um, and as I mentioned, I water my peace lily once a once a week. But peace lilies will tell you. They will tell you when they need some love. They will tell you when they need particularly water because a lot of the times it's just water that they want. Um, if your plant is overgrown and you can tell if it's too big for your pot, like if it's literally overgrown so then sometimes you might need to repot the peace lily but a lot of the times it is in need of water or more sunlight and you just move it around you really just experiment with it but i would say uh, the best conditions would be to keep a well uh, watered peace lily mm -hmm. and with the watering um uh, i want to mention also that uh, some people think like oh i'll just create a schedule and i'll just water my plants on the schedule while um you know in theory that might seem like the best thing but you got to remember like there's so many variations that you know humidity and things like that in our homes especially in the winter so you always want to uh you know kind of like put your finger in the soil and see you know what's going on with the soil before you water your plants because honestly like I can speak from experience. There's been so many times when I've killed the plant just from overwatering. That's it. Like if a, you know, if the roots start to rot uh, at the bottom, and you know, you can't visually see that, but you can test it, you know, with your finger to prevent that from happening in the future. Right. So me being able to develop my system of once a week for the peace lily and actually my other large plant is because I've been doing, I've been caring for them for so many years and I've been able to figure out like what, what it is that they need. But when I do introduce new plants into my home, I definitely don't use a prescriptive schedule. Like you, you need to learn it, check the check to see how much it's drinking essentially throughout the week. And that can be dependent on where you place your plant in your home. Yes. Um, and if you're, if you're like really particular, um, particularly terrible at overwatering your plants, um, many uh, stores sell this thing called like a moisture meter. So if you're really concerned about it, you can purchase one of those, you can stick it in your plant and that moisture meter will tell you if the plant needs to be watered or not. Um, but it, that's if you want to spend that kind of money, I think they can be a little bit expensive. So. I mean, you, you're, you had fish growing up in your house, right? Yes. Yes. So there's a, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fish. <laughs> I, I knew the answer to that. Your face made it even funnier. <laughs> so the question though is um, they have seen plants uh, growing with fish. And do you know like which plants are the best to grow with fish? 
So aquatic plants uh, like are beautiful, right? So we spoke about that when we talked about the different type of plants. Um, but again, when you're growing plants with fish, it's kind of like you're going to get into that same thing with like pets in your household, right? So my dad had fish tanks growing up our whole life and he had some wonderfully beautiful plants that were, you know, coexisting uh, with different fish that we had. But we had times that we had certain fish that would obliterate the plants, you know, either dig them up, you know, to lay eggs or just eat them. So again, it would depend on, you know, that, that aquatic ecosystem that you have going on. If you particularly just wanna grow aquatic plants, um, I think it might be a lot easier than growing aquatic plants along with, you know, different species of fish because you're going to run into, you know, a whole bunch of different issues when it comes to that. If that Do you helps. recall what plants were, um, what plant or plant may it get any of these? I'm trying to remember. I wish he was here right now. <laughs> I don't <laughs> remember. I don't remember the species and I don't want to say the wrong thing, but that's yeah. definitely something that I can ask him, you know, and look into. And I feel like pathos would be a good plant just because they do so well in water. Um, but I do not know for sure if that is a great plant to grow along with fish, but they do really well growing in water. Um, so we are at our time. Um, but let me, there are a few more questions and comments in the chat that I want to make sure that we get um, a chance to respond to, and we like to have give people to, the chance to talk to us if you want to. So uh, what would you say is the best plant to gift a client slash black thumb? <laughs> um, I'll let you answer too, La, but for me, like I give snake plants as gifts all the time because I have so many snake plant babies. Um, no, spider I'm plants. sorry, spider plants. I did it again. Yes. <laughs> spider plants because, you know, they're obviously so easy to propagate with, you know, little hassle, but also snake plants because the snake plants are so hardy and it's very hard to kill them. Um, and these are plants that I've been making these little macrame plant hangers. Uh, you know, if you know me personally, you know, I've been like pumping them out by the dozens <laughs> at this point. But um, those are also great plants to, you know, hang in windows as well. They do well as hanging plants. And I would say peace lilies. Um, they, they are gifted quite frequently, and I think that they are pretty easy to care for. But for sure, I'm going to echo Camille and say spider plants because th those are easy. Yeah. And then they're beautiful. I mean, look, they, they grow really huge in a, in a short amount of time. So uh, I think that the snake plants and the spider plants are very great for beginners because they're nine times out of 10 going to do well. So it gives you that confidence, you know, as a young, you know, a, a beginner plant mom. And then from that point, you can step on to, you know, some plants that may be a little bit, uh, you know, more involved to care for. So which plants would you recommend to hang first? I, I would hang pathos because they, we don't have a picture of those, but let me put it in the chat how it's spelled so you can look it up if you are unfamiliar. But they are a vining plant, so they look really, really good once they get mature because they will like they will spill over. Mm -hmm. And we already know Camille's favorite hanging plant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a, that's another thing about I'm going to be to like is this a spider plant class? <laughs> but no, so that's another beautiful thing about spider plants that I was pointing out uh to one of my girlfriends recently is that when they're large and very mature, those offshoots like you guys can see back here, the longer they get, they're going to spill over also um and be really beautiful as a hanging plant. So I'm going to adjust this camera um so that you guys can see the one that I have uh, in my living room window here. That one's about maybe like a year old or so. Again, another great, great grandbaby of my mother's plant. And uh, in the summertime, oh my God, it just looks amazing. It's like a waterfall, so. Yeah, someone mentioned that bamboo is pretty and they're pretty hardy for plant killers. That's true, they're, they're definitely easy care. Yeah. Bill, it looks like somebody said, oh, dude, so do you have an orchid tip? Because I thought, I thought that orchid might have been the easy care. I said, orchids are definitely not easy to care for. But I think, do you have an orchid, a tip for plant care for orchids? I have killed every orchid that I've ever gotten. So I'm definitely not the person. And this is, you know, just <laughs> being purely honest. Um, I have not done well uh, with orchids at all. So I don't, I don't think I'm the person to ask about orchids. <laughs> me, me either. I like to say that, um, especially with our outdoor gardens, flowers are too delicate for me. I can do plants. 
um, plants are, uh, as we saw the word, like plants are hardy and plants are so resilient and that those are edible plants and these uh, more decorative plants, but flowers are a little too delicate for my nature. They require a lot from me. <laughs> Uh, someone in the chat, Victor, did mention to everyone that orchids do require a specific type of soil. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, I know I see orchids all the time. Like, you know, they sell them. Like, you know, they're they're not expensive in Ikea, you know, Home Depot. You can find them everywhere. Um, and they're beautiful. But we'll, we'll get to flowers eventually. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get to being good at, uh, you know, propagating flowers. I do want to mention really quickly also, uh, when it comes to water propagation, I failed to mention this during a demonstration but um there's kind of two schools of thought so some people never change the water like ever and you know their their propagation does fine but some people will tell you you know change it often because as the water sits there's going to be less oxygen quality in the water so I do change my water every so often but I'm not such a stickler that I'm like oh every day I have to like you know replace the water so you know that's something to think about as well but if you just look at your plant and you pay attention to the health of it, it's gonna be growing just like it would, you know, in soil. So this one, it started out very, very small. And again, you just see how well it's rooted um, and how good it's doing. And it's only been a few weeks. I've changed the water on this one, I think two times. Yeah, I have a pothos plant that uh, I'm propagating. Well, it lives in water. It's beyond the propagation stage, but <laughs> I do, um, I change the water infrequently but I do change the water and I really and actually not even change I'm just adding water because the, the roots are drinking it so um I'll just add, add more water I know sometimes uh Camille has mentioned um the benefit of creating uh, like eggshell water some people use eggshells I've seen in these groups people creating like banana water um I think even rice water rice water was like a craze with natural hair like so people are using these different uh waters and so essentially just placing these uh things in water draining it well taking the things out and then using that water to feed your plant so the different chemicals um and nutrients that are pulled from the food products um are then shared with the plants yes and <laughs> keep doing the eggs because i didn't really like the smell i thought like it was a smell <laughs> One thing that I've come across also, and I know we're like over our time, but I just want to share this for anyone who's still here. In the summertime with all my water propagation experiments, one thing I've noticed is that you got to look out for mosquito larvae, right? So if a mosquito like comes into your house and makes its way to your propagation station, it's going to lay its eggs in that water. And then you're going to have mosquitoes flying around your house. So that's just another reason to change it more often, especially in the warmer months and just something to be aware of. Okay, we are over our time just by a few. Um, so I wanted to thank you all again for joining us this morning and essentially just kicking off this beautiful sunny day. We haven't had many of those lately in Pennsylvania. Uh, so thank you for starting off your Saturday with us. Um, this will be the moment if anybody wants to say anything as we close out, you are welcome to unmute yourself, say hello, say goodbye, um, but thank you. Thank y'all so Thank much you. for participating. Yes, Thank we, we appreciate you. you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I am going to end it. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Love y'all.